and welcome to Victory On Demand. We hope that this service you're about to watch helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in some way that helps you take your next step. We want to connect with you. We know that life is busy and that you may be watching this on a Tuesday afternoon or maybe a Saturday morning or some other day of the week that isn't Sunday. And that's the beauty of On Demand and that God can use any of the other 167 hours of the week to connect us back to Him. But we want to be able to include you as part of our church family and to help you take your next step wherever that may be. Let us know that you're here by clicking on one of the buttons that's popping up on your screen right now. Now, no matter who you are, where you are, or what you're struggling with, our goal is to equip you with a new perspective that you'll hopefully be able to use in order to live life in a better way. And we pray that as you live out God's word, that you would truly experience something more, something better. If you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. We're so glad that you've chosen to be a part of Victory today, and we hope that you enjoy our service. All right, good morning, Victory. Let's try that again. Good morning, Victory. Good morning. It is student takeover, so we've got a fun game for you today. Kids and students. Kids and students. Well, we, we have this ongoing debate, which is better, kids or students. So how many of you guys think that kids can win? Okay, okay. Now, how many of you know that students can win? Come on, come on. Wow. All right. You're, wow. you're, you don't have the home field advantage, but I think you can still pull out a win, okay? So um, we have... A uh, uh, family feud style survey game. If you follow us on Instagram over the last couple of days, we put some questions out there. And so these answers were going to be based on your responses. So, you guys ready? Yeah. First up. Are you guys ready? All right, contestant number one, come on up. And as soon as we see the question, you got a buzz. I feel like this isn't really a fair game here. <laughs> well, the good news is that we a have lot the of this. cuteness factor over here. A lot of this has to do with luck. So, you know, it could be anybody's game. So, and I don't know which questions are coming up, but here we go. Buzz in when you have it. You've got three seconds to answer. Question number one. Which victory ministry requires the most game changers? Volunteers. Maybe they don't know the word Volunteers. game changers. Do you know? I know you want to. We've got... Welcome. The student ministry? Is student ministry on there? Okay. Okay, okay. Now, you have a chance to get a better answer than him. Okay? So, you have one in mind? Which yeah. ministry, which area of the church needs the most adults? You have an idea? The, the, the music, the, the worship? Worship production. Okay, let's right. see. Is, it, is worship or production production on there? It is. Oh, and it's a higher answer. So we're gonna go to the kids. All right, nice try. Maybe better luck next time. A little <laughs> disappointed, but that's okay. All right. So you guys have five seconds each. We're gonna go one by one, and you're gonna try to guess the other things on the board. Okay, ready? Here we go. Areas that need adults. Five, four, Anyone? three, two, one. Hmm. Time? Nothing? Got anything? Oh, who are you? All right, so you got <laughs> two more strikes. Okay. Do, should we give them some it's options? It's really hard not to cheat right now. Yeah, should I we give we them some, give some options? Some okay. Options. I feel so like they deserve that. There's, there's areas, there's the welcome team, people that greet you when you come in. There's, uh, what else is there? <laughs> kids. <laughs> there's kids ministry. Wow. There's the early childhood. There's... Uh, people who clean up, there's, yes? People that clean up. People that clean up. Is it on the board? The it most? It is not. Nope, that's the not most. our biggest so, team. You got one more chance. You got five seconds. Can Four, three, two, one. Kids. Woo! Kids. Let's see, let's it's see kids on the board. There. It yeah. is. All right, all right. <laughs> all right. Know. You get to keep going until you get them all or a okay. third strike. Five. Any more guesses? Four. Three, two, one. 
Mm. That's time. Okay. Okay, so you guys have five seconds to collaborate together and give me one answer. They've all been five, spoken. All four, the answers have been three, spoken. Two, one. Answer. Welcome team. Welcome team. Is that on the board? It is. Okay. Which means you steal those points. Okay. You redeemed yourself a little bit. Okay. But we got plenty more questions, so let's try to breeze through these and give everybody a chance to come back. What was the number two answer? It was early childhood. Early childhood. childhood. So all your stuff. I mean, yeah. That makes sense. All right. It definitely all right. makes sense. So uh, next question, next contestant. All right. Remember Buzz, and you got three seconds to answer once you see the question. The question is... On a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to fall asleep during a sermon? So any number, one through 10. Good job. Five. Five. Yes. It's five on the board. That's right. Wait. It is. Woo. Okay. And you have the chance to get a higher number. Eight. It's eight wow, on the eight. board. It's a snoozer. Wow. It's on the board, but theirs was higher, so we're gonna go with the kids again, all right? You got five more seconds, okay? Let's Numbers continue. one through ten, how likely are you to fall asleep during a sermon? Five, four, three, two, six. Six. Is that on the board? Strike ah, one. Okay. Close, Five, close. four, yeah, anything else? three, two, four. four. Yes. There we go. Okay. Five, four, two. This is much two. easier. <laughs> okay. It's the number two answer. All right. Five. Oh, more. Four. What? I like one. She has button enthusiasm. One is the number one. So you guys like to not <laughs> sleep in church. Good, Good for job. you. Good job. All right. There's one more answer. Is there? Five, four, Let's get the number. three. Three. Yes. And it was three. All right. Kids get all those points that time. We did Next it. Next contestant. We did it. We did it. All right. This will be our last question, okay? Who's next over here? Here we go. All right. Here's your question. Who on Victory Staff is most terrified of heights? <laughs> Me. <laughs> am I on the board? There. Oh, there I am. Is. Okay. okay. I am actually terrified of heights. Okay. Here's the pictures. Um, you get a chance to get a higher one. Who do you think is most scared of heights? Three, two, one. Just push one. the button and guess. Push the button and guess. Rick. 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 No. All right. So we're going to go to the board. students over here. All right. I'm coming over. Here's your options. This is what everybody got on Instagram. So who is the most terrified of heights? Five, four. David. David. Nope. Strike one. Five, four, three, two. Josh. Josh. <laughs> In unison, they say Josh. Strike no. two. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Aaron. 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 <laughs> oh, a lot of people think Aaron's afraid of heights. <laughs> All right, five, four, three, two, one. Chelsea. Me? Is Chelsea on the board? No. That's the third strike. All right, kids, right. you can win this thing. We totally can. If you can get any of them on the board, you steal those points. Okay, just just start guessing them. Danny. Danny. Danny, is he on there? Yes. He is. Woo. Okay, so you stole those points. Congratulations, kids oh, won. We won. We won. You stole those points. So, who did we say was the number three answer? Luann. Luann. Okay. And the number one answer? Who's the most terrified of heights? Dalton. Dalton. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Better not film any music videos of him at the Grand Canyon playing guitar uh, over Yeah, cliff. you're right. I wonder All if he's... Right. Dalton, you can text me. I wonder if you're actually scared of heights. Okay. <laughs> but that's what you guys think. So, thank you guys for playing Victory Church Says. So, yeah, yes, give them a round of applause. You guys can have a seat, and you can check out this video. I want to welcome you to Victory and to our next-gen we weekend. Kids and students take over. We're at the you're joining us online or here in person today. We are so glad you're here. Something we love to celebrate is our first time guests. Can we welcome our first time guests? <laughs> Text new to 317-576-2288. We want to give you a free gift. If you're in person, stop by the Connection Center. 
And if you've been here two weeks or more, or if you call Victory your home, please check in on the Victory app to let us know you're here and to help us better connect and care for you and your family. We want to help you you and your family stay connected to what's going on here. So we introduce the top three. This week, you can find info about Mother's Day. Did we mention there be crumble cookies? Bring your mama to church. <laughs> Registrations for Summer Surge and VBS in our pop-up promotion Sunday on June 4th. You can access the top three each week in the Victory app or on our website. Thanks again for joining us today and helping to set up the next gen to win. Get, Get ready, ready for kids and students takeover! <laughs> So, now there is no commission for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-given spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Romans 8, 5-6 Those who are denominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think things that pleased the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting life, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Romans eight twelve through 13. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. But if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death of your sinful, the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. Romans fourteen seventeen, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you a fearful slave. Instead, you received God's Spirit. When he adopts you as his own child, now we call him Ababa, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must share his suffering. Romans 8, 31. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Romans 8.37 Despite all the things, overwhelming, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Okay. I'm done. Let's give him a round of applause. All right, welcome to Victory. Let's stand and worship.
slip to it, and it seems it's too late. Hope is buried and dead in the grave. I'll speak your name. Oh, I'll speak your name.
At Victory, something we do here each week is practice the rhythm of generosity. Everything you see here is a product of someone's sacrifice, our combined generosity at work fueling the mission and vision of our church and what God is doing here. If you've given anything here at Victory, I just wanna say thank you. We talk about the way our money gets used for all sorts of different ministries, but it's not often that we are able to talk about how it affects the different environments within our church and the lives of our kids and students. This last October, we were able to launch our Sidekicks program and sensory room for the growing physical and emotional needs of children. Benny has been a huge help and support. We've also been able to open our Victory Kids Shop, which is where kids get their rewards for memorizing scripture and doing their devotional packets. And if you ever peek into the gym during second service, you'll see our next level kids zooming around, which has really changed their language from I have to stay for both hours to I get to stay for both hours when their parents are serving. Our kids in student areas often need updates and repairs as equipment gets old or outdated or just stops working. It's the basic necessities that we don't talk about as much because it's just not as exciting to talk about, but it's absolutely essential to creating environments that help students have a good time with each other as they learn to walk more in step with their savior. If you'd like to partner with us and with God in the life-changing opportunities happening here, there are a few ways that you can do that. You can send money to my personal Venmo, no, which no. is at the bottom of the screen. You can't do that. You can, you can send money here to the church, uh, but designate there in the little memo section of your check to the student ministry no. so that... Still no. No. Come on. Okay, no. No. I'll do this. <laughs> no, how you can actually give here is you can send your money directly to my Venmo, no, which hey, is... <laughs> whoa, whoa, no, 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 that's... In, in all seriousness, though, um, our, our leadership does a great job at, at the budgeting and knowing what ministries need what throughout the year. So if you could just donate to Victory Christian Church using the boxes in the back of the auditorium uh, and in the stairwells, or you can do it on the Victory app if you're watching online or at victorycc.life on our website, or even just the old fashioned way and mail us a check to the address on the screen. Anything else? No, I think that's it, you covered yeah. it. Okay, <laughs> so thank you so much for your generosity. It is making a huge difference here in Franklin and up in Indy and Edinburgh and everywhere that we have the opportunity to just have some influence that God has given us. And, uh, and it's allowing us to be the, the stewards of the resources that God has given us in a way that's really awesome and powerful. And we are directly impacted in our ministries. So thank you for that. Your, Your generosity, generosity is changing, changing lives, lives forever. 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 Rhett, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Following Jesus means to give up your sin and do what God wants you to do because telling the truth and doing the right thing even if it gets you grounded from a week for a week it it always comes with a benefit to follow Jesus means to have faith in him and to obey him even when he wants you to do something that is very hard or we follow Jesus because when you're sad, mad, angry, or frustrated, then you can pray to God to always make your um, feelings better. Or something that you might not like or want to do. To follow Jesus is to be kind and caring and loving towards others as the way he is to us. Like, it means to be very helpful and kind and sweet and all those things. Because Jesus is the best thing in the whole wide world. He knows everything, even more than the smartest grown up. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Um, by loving him and caring him. And by obeying him whenever it is hard to, and by following him. To follow Jesus means to spread the word about Jesus. Because Jesus knows what's best. He's God's son, and he is where the joy is. Just like Tara Lee Cobble says. And that's it. Goodbye. <laughs> oh. 
Well, good morning, Victory. I'm so thrilled to be able to see so many kids and students represented up here on the stage today. And each week as the kids minister here, I have the privilege to serve alongside so many of you as game changers. And we get to see so many kids getting involved, more invested and growing in their faith every single week. And the best of all, over in the kids area, we have the most fun. So if there are any kids in this room, do we have fun? Do we have fun? Yeah, you guys, if there's one thing you're good at, it's cheering really, really loud. So the, like, they have to shut the doors sometimes because we're so loud over there. Today's message is going to be a bit of a switch up from what you adults are used to, but over in the kids area, we know that the average attention span of a child is about two to 10 minutes. So it, that's if we're lucky, you know? So I get to set up our message with some general biblical overview. And of course, it wouldn't be kids ministry without an object lesson. And then Zach, our student minister, and my husband will close us out later on in this service. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? There's power in simplicity, but we just, we, we get a really tangible example of that in that video that we just showed, where kids described from their perspective what it means to follow him. And it can be tempting to overcomplicate what it means, but when it comes down to the basic truth of it all, I believe there's power in the simplicity of faith. One of my favorite things about kids that I've come to notice over the last year leading in the elementary environment is their absolute inability to acknowledge certain social norms. Um, and I actually, like I'm not dogging on kids for this. I love this. It has kept me humble. It has kept me on my toes. But a, a recent example would be the kids worship, was, worship room was really quiet. I was about to give my lesson. Um, and I had, we just finished up our worship time and I opened my mouth to start to speak. And I just, out of the corner of my eye, see a child like appear. Like it was like almost like cartoonish, like boop, there they were. And she asked me a multi-layered spiritual question with the silent room in the background of her. And she had complete anticipation that I was going to answer her right there in that moment. And obviously in that moment, I, I wasn't able to because I had to get, keep things going. But here's the thing. This child was not trying to be rude or disrespectful. Kids simply just want their questions answered, even though it threw me off a little bit. And while this may seem like a silly example, I was actually reminded of so many biblical examples of this happening to Jesus while he was um, leading his disciples and, and speaking to crowds. Um, and people, adults, not children, were desiring Jesus so deeply that they went against social norms just to get him. Zacchaeus climbed a sycamore tree. The woman, deemed as unclean, did whatever she could to touch the hem of Jesus' robe. By her faith, she was healed. And there was a biblical, or the, there was a blind Bartimaeus from the Gospel of Mark, or the Gentile woman who sought Jesus' help for her demon-possessed daughter. I mean, these the things that these desperate people. They were real, they were real, and they had, the one thing that they had in common was that they had faith. And this is a very known passage of scripture, but I think that when we are asking how to follow Jesus, we need to be reminded of what Matthew 18, one through five says. It says, at the time that the disciples came to Jesus, they asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And kids, are you listening? Because this is about you. Jesus called a little child to him and placed the child among them. He said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. I know this is not new content to most of you, but Jesus is very clear about this. Our faith must be simplistic and childlike. The enemy is not happy when we make progress in our faith like this. And I think if the enemy were to attack, it would be simply by distracting us. Maybe the biggest win for the enemy would be by distracting all of us from the necessity of faith in general. And to make us so distracted and comfortable that we, are, we become apathetic to what we're missing. To overwhelm us with these endless tasks and meaningless hustle, at some of the time, we actually create that for ourselves, and then we complain about it. I mean, we're all guilty of it. So my generation and younger, we're typically known for spending way too much time on social media, and I'll own that, I probably do that. Our generation likes to scroll reels, we like to share videos, and we, we communicate a lot differently. And I'm not really one to sit on social media for a long time unless it's on reels, because I mean, if you don't know what reels are, they're basically just like reposted old TikTok videos and I'm not cool enough to be on TikTok, so I spend my time on Instagram reels. 
But I mean, I'm going somewhere with this, so hear me out. The other day, I was scrolling, and I mean, I've perfectly trained my algorithm to feed me this like perfect blend of meal prep tips, mom hacks, and then, you know, that deep spiritual ministry content, which is very important. But 90% of what what I see on my Instagram are just these ridiculously dumb videos that Zach and I communicate by. Like sometimes we'll go a whole day and we won't speak, but we'll have sent each other like 16 to 20 different reels. Like that's literally how we communicate sometimes. Is anybody else like that? Just us? Okay. Well, it makes us laugh. It keeps us lighthearted. Life's too hard. Loosen up. <laughs> so uh, I had been reading in Romans that day to prepare for this message and I was swiping and I paused on this simple video of a man saying, how can my entire life as a Jesus follower, be focused on spending an eternity with God, with my Savior, and I can't even spend 10 minutes with him today. And that just hit me different, and I'm guilty of this. I'm, I flood my mind with these meaningless tasks, these, this overwhelm. I, I catch myself working in my own strength and not in God's. Life is full of distractions, and our kids and students have more distractions than they ever have. And adults, we know that this doesn't slow down. We're caught in this tension of loving Jesus and wanting to serve him, but carrying some really full loads of just general life priorities. To which I ask, was it supposed to be this way? What's ironic is that the enemy has been using distractions against God's people for all of time. Um, Even just think about the first sin. The enemy said, hey, like Eve, you have this perfect life. God's provided you everything you could ever need. He's, he's promised you like comfort and all of these things. But then the enemy somehow distracts this perfect life with an apple. And it seems almost ridiculous if you think about the like, logistics of that. Like, can you imagine having the perfect, sinless, blameless life and being distracted by something like an apple? Like, that's just crazy, but it sounds familiar. So today we are going to recount the story of God's relationship with his people all throughout history. And we are in the book of Romans where Paul summarizes what it means to have our lives fully built on Jesus. We're given these truths about who God is and about who we are, and then we're given a pathway on how we get close to God. But that requires parts of us that need to die to our old ways and to be pruned. And kids, if you don't know what pruning is, it's when you cut off a part of a bush or a branch and a new one so that new life can grow. So sometimes we have to get rid of the old so that the new can come in. We make room for the new. In chapter 11, Paul is describing God's mercy by reminding the Israelites of the mercy that they were given and the need for others to have that exact same mercy. And he blessed the nation of Israel with the truth so that they could be a blessing to those around them. And instead, they had this blessing, but instead they viewed this blessing as entitlement, and then they rebelled against God's ways time and time and time again. And Paul used this analogy of an olive tree and pruning to make his point. So Romans 8, 1, this was read earlier, it says, therefore there is no, anyone, condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, a very familiar verse that we all love. In our culture, we really like, we're really good at highlighting this verse because it sounds good, but What we're not good at is allowing that to fully change us from the inside out, to allow that to prune away the parts of us that really need to die so that we can truly and fully live in God. Um, I'm going to have a couple helpers come up. You can start making your way to the stage, you two. Um, And obviously, it's not going to be kids ministry without an object lesson, but I cannot guarantee you that it's going to work because I've done this like eight or nine times now, and two of the times it failed. So that's kids' ministry, though. We, we're human. We work with it, but it's going to make sense in the end. So what are some priorities that we have in life? These are the things that we have to do. These are the non-negotiable things like work, school, eating, hygiene, homework, chores, and adults. It's the things like meal prep, mowing the lawn, paying the bills, shuttling the kids to and from practices. And I know I could go on and on and on. So... I have some toothpicks here. I'm gonna give you each a toothpick. And these toothpicks, hold it up nice and tall. These toothpicks, they represent all of life's tensions, struggles, and our distractions, our priorities. And then, you're gonna have to be patient with me. Here is a balloon. Lungs, okay. So this balloon, represents our lives, <laughs> maybe. Our lives, yeah, it does represent our lives. Life's a struggle sometimes. So 
that it represents our state of mind and our foundation, so to speak. So, you know, it's like, it's intact, it's full, it's, full, it's, it's good, our foundation. So if we come at life with our own power, I'm going to have, who wants to pop the balloon? You do. You look like you want to pop a balloon. So if we come at life without, without coming at God first, this is what happens. Ready? Ah! <laughs> That actually really surprised me. That was an authentic reaction there. Okay. <laughs> and now, let's see if this, we're going to see if it works. Okay. So this oil here, I mean, it's olive oil. And I just kind of was like, this will be good because we're talking about the olive tree. Olive oil. Okay. These, this oil represents things like all of the 100, like, million gajillion blessings and promises that God has poured on us. So these are things like, and I'm not going to do this because it's a mess, but like imagine me pouring these over the balloon, okay, to, to create like a barrier. These are things like promises of salvation, forgiveness, guidance, provision, peace, strength, and comfort. And we just come at life a little bit differently. So here's the next balloon. I got oil on my hand. A little bit more. Not too much, because I'm scared. Okay. <laughs> All right. So go ahead and give your toothpick a really good dip. So remember, these are God's blessings that he's already told us. He's already told us all that we need, and he's given us all that we need. Here, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to make sure you have lots of Jesus, <laughs> lots of Jesus on your, on your toothpick. Okay. We're fully submerged. We're fully immersed. Are we ready? Okay. Here's, here's life. Ready? Okay. Poke it really nice and slow. Let's see. <gasps> Did you see that? Okay. That literally, like, the oil creates this barrier, and it keeps the balloon fully intact. So when we come at, at Jesus, when we come at life with the protection of Jesus, remembering who we are in Christ, remembering all the things that he's already spoken over our lives, well, it's kind of shrinking, but typically it's going to block the hole, and this will stay completely intact. Thank you, girls. Can you guys give them a round of applause? Thanks for helping. You can you go sit down? I'm just going to drop that. <laughs> Our foundation doesn't waver, and our health and our mind is still strong because of knowing what God said he would do. We have this, this, like, this confidence in Christ. And if we don't know who God is, how can we expect our lives to actually be changed? So church, I wonder if the reason that we have such a hard time bridging that gap between our minds, or because our minds are so set on the concerns and the issues of this current day, rather than what this, uh, the Spirit actually desires from us. And I believe that God is always prodding us back to him. He's always pulling our hearts back to him. And his law is written on our hearts. So if you ever feel like your life is out of control, kids, students, adults, if you've ever felt like your life is out of control, then I wonder if we've just forgotten this simple ancient truth to set our minds and our hearts on him. In the kids' areas, we focus a lot and we focus hard on the basic core truths of the Bible. And I think... As we grow and as life throws us more curveballs and as we go through really hard things, we get distracted. And when we aren't grounded in our faith, the enemy is able to pull us off course pretty discreetly without us even noticing sometimes. Jesus explained this all along. In Matthew 16, 25, he says, those who try to find their life will lose it. And those who live their life for me will find it. We're promised a full and provided for life through Christ. So let me leave you thinking with, through these few questions. What is fighting for your mind today? Are we seeing these distractions as enemy warfare, or are we just justifying them as they're just part of life? The enemy wants nothing more than to captivate our minds with anything other than what God desires, even if that thing isn't even sinful in nature. So do we truly know God? Have we become numb or apathetic in the desire to know God? I'm convicted by this. Check out this powerful testimony video of one of our own Victory students whose life has radically been changed by the power of God. My name is Lolly. I'm a senior in high school and I've been coming to Victory since I was in kindergarten. I used to always want to come because I had a lot of friends here. Eventually, my parents ended up splitting up and we kind of stopped coming as much. I used to tell my dad that I always wanted to come so he would make sure that I came. But eventually that even stopped and it's around like middle school that I kind of just 
stopped coming. I just, I didn't feel like it was needed anymore. And um, I ended up getting in with the wrong crowd. I was focused on other things. In the end of eighth grade, I ended up experimenting with different substances and it became an addiction for multiple things and just like completely getting in with the wrong crowd. I had totally wrong mindset and all of my friends from church kind of like did not want to be around me because I wasn't like the type of person that they wanted to be around. I ended up self-harming and I gained an eating disorder. Around junior year is when it got really, really bad. My parents were really concerned, and eventually I um, ended up getting sick. It got to the point where I had to use it every day to function before I even got to school, or else I was sick all day. I realized that it just kind of had to stop because it was getting to a point that it was just so bad. Eventually, I quit the the day that I like. I was like, this this can't happen anymore. I ended up just throwing everything away, and um, I talked to my dad about it, and then we ended up praying about it, and we prayed like every night because. It was really hard. It made me really sick, even though before I quit, I was already getting sick because I was addicted to it so badly. Around that time was student takeover last year and they showed the everything video. I really related to it because it was all the things that I was struggling with. I was really into church and then I did end up getting in with the wrong crowd and then my mindset changed on everything. I ended up wanting to be a partier more than anything else. After watching it, I thought that it would help if I got more in with the church. And before that, I um, I didn't really think I'd like fit in here because I wasn't perfect. And I didn't think that I, didn't, I deserved to like serve on the worship team and stuff. And um, seeing that, I realized that other people do go through it. After watching that video, I realized that some things in my life had to change. I ended up realizing that I couldn't even go to school because it reminded me so much of everything, especially the high school that I went to. Everybody was doing what I didn't want to do in the bathrooms. so. I just kind of realized that I wasn't going to be able to do it next year if I was going to make sure that I stayed clean. So I ended up becoming homeschooled and doing my last senior year online. I missed out on so much stuff, but I realized that it was more important for me to not be around all of the things that that high school had me around. After the year had begun, the high school gatherings were starting up again, and it was kind of hard because I didn't really think that people here were going to like me because some of them knew what I was doing, and I didn't know if they were gonna judge me and think that I wasn't good enough, but that wasn't really how it turned out. I ended up making friends and that really helped me because I wasn't able to be around my old friends. I kinda just had to be alone until I made better friends here. I ended up joining the worship team and it really helped me. That's 
basically my only coping mechanism now because everything's gone. I haven't done anything since about a year ago. I really think that the, not really the like worship team, but like just worshiping has really helped me a lot and go through everything that I had to go through. It made me realize that I am worth something and that um, my past doesn't define who I am. I'm so thankful for God for getting me out of the situation that I was in and for giving me the strength to get out of everything that I was doing. And I'm happy to be celebrating one year sober. If anyone is going through anything similar, I would really advise you to talk to someone here because even if you think you're not, you're not worth it and you're not good enough, they're not gonna look at you like that. So if you guys are anything like me and throughout the week you get distracted by all the toothpicks in your life um, and everything that life has to throw at you, um, I often forget to thank God, whether it's the little things like a shelter over my head or for the opportunity to go to a, a safe school. Um, but we have communion and it's a designated time that we have each week to slow down and just thank God and remember him and especially for his gift that he's given us. 1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 25 says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. He could have easily just said, Remember me. But he gave us a physical way that we can remember his ultimate sacrifice. This cracker represents the body of which he um, was on the cross, and the juice represents the blood that was shed. We have a physical reminder of the sacrifice that we can set our eyes on each week. We do this as a church each week, and we do it continuously so that we remember together and start each week on the reflection of him. We need this remembrance weekly to sustain us. Just as food sustains our physical bodies, this remembrance sustains our eternal bodies. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ultimate sacrifice you've given us. I pray that we take this communion as a way to remember and honor you. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins and that we can have an eternal life with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Jesus, you are, that you are, and hello, peace, hello, joy, hello, love, and hello, strength, hello, hope is a new horizon, hello, peace, hello, joy, hello, love, and hello, strength, hello, and I'm a junior at Franklin Community High School. So at a really young age, my parents always like brought me to church. I did the church thing. I, I didn't really understand it too much till I got older. Um, we had a family friend really close to us pass away and that kind of like shook me for a second. I didn't know what to do. And then I saw how his parents were reacting to the whole situation and uh, how they didn't like push away from God, they kind of pulled towards him. And that just helped me kind of get back on track, I guess, and keep expanding. And then a couple summers after that, I ended up going to Allendale with a couple of my friends, never done anything like that before, no like overnights or anything. I was really nervous. And I ended up having one of the best weeks of my life. And I went back the next year and that was all I could go back. And now I'm a counselor there and do CIY every year as a camper. And uh, it's one of the greatest weeks of the summer. I always make that a, a week I can't miss. I think a lot of how you like carry yourself is like, it happens when you're young and the things you've gone through and the things that like, you know, your experiences in life. And then my experiences are much different than a lot of my friends. But then you come to church and you find friends that are like, don't have the same experiences, but ones that are more similar because they're, I don't know, they're just here and you guys can help each other talk about it and learn and grow together. Church for me, I don't know, it's like a safe place. I feel more at home here. I really realized like what God was doing for me. I think it was going into seventh grade year at Camp Allendale. And ever since then, it's just been like, evolving, getting greater and greater. I play tennis, I dive, and now baseball. So I'm pretty busy in sports all year round. You know, it's not great to miss church. You don't really want to miss it, but there's been a few times where I can't do the athletic events, but when I can be here, I am. Another thing helps me get here each week, the students that are here and the leaders that are here. I talk to them, I've grown up with them for years now, and just being able to see them and talk to them, just, it's kind of like a routine. Um, so I, I am in high school, soon to be going on to college. And from what I've heard, college is where you like really expand and you really you know, create you sort of in a way. And I realized I want to do that in like a Christian environment. So I'm looking at like more Christian colleges and things where I can really grow my faith and be the best me I can be. What I love about the stories that we've been able to hear this morning is the realignment of priorities in such an applicable way, in a way that you know each and every one of us, no matter our age, we always wrestle with the same things, which is why, as Chelsea and I were preparing for this Sunday, kind of our topic changed this last week from what we were going to talk about to what we are talking about, because I feel like the simplest truths are the ones that are hardest to live out sometimes. And, uh, and so I, I want to kind of briefly leave you with a couple verses here that, uh, that hopefully as you go out today can encourage you 
and, uh, and remind you why it is that we are here and, and why we worship. And uh, that ultimately, it's not our own power that transforms us or, or, or changes our lives. It's, it's the work of God in us. I think we all would agree. But here, we're going to find exactly how Paul breaks this down. Because see, through Romans 1 through 11, especially 9 through 11, he's been making the case about God's mercy. And in chapter 11, he uses this analogy of an olive tree to, to show that, you know, as time has gone on, God has never changed. His promises are still the same. And all throughout history, throughout the nation of Israel, when they, uh, when, when they sinned, when they rebelled, when they turned their back on him, they, he would prune off the parts of them that were no longer bearing fruit. And he would even graft in others um, from outside the nation of Israel to be a part of the kingdom, to be a part of his his blessed people to be a blessing to others. All throughout the Old Testament, uh, God seems to make examples of the older brother, and and he he fights tradition and makes the younger brother the one that is is the one that succeeds. All throughout history, you see God moving and making a way for anybody who wants to share the same faith as Abraham. And so Paul makes the case that, hey, the new Israel is all those who are of the faith of Abraham. And that was fulfilled through Jesus. And uh, it's funny, you ever heard the, the term extend an olive branch, right? An offer of peace? Uh, Josh has spoken a great series on peace the last few weeks. If you haven't caught that, I would encourage you to go and catch up on it. And this builds directly off of that. This, this, is, this is something that was a common phrase even in Greco-Roman times. And so it makes sense that Paul is using it. But it also, we see the first signs of this in the book of Genesis in chapter 8 when Noah is waiting for the water to recede so they can start civilization over after the flood. And he sends out this dove. And when the dove finally returns, it returns with a freshly plucked olive leaf. Almost like God extending the branch back to us to graft us back into his plan, to his story, should we choose to accept And so Paul says, in view of this, in view of God's mercy, that each and every one of us get to benefit, no matter our background, no matter our our past or our baggage, in view of his mercy, this is what he says in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. It says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. See, our bodies are extensions of our hearts and our souls, and out of the overflow of our hearts is, is what will be demonstrated with our words and with our actions and our bodies will follow. So maybe a good question is, does the way that I handle myself, my time, my finances, my, the way I entertain myself, my use of social media, all of those things, what I wear, how I present myself with my words and my actions, does that point people to Christ? Do all those things demonstrate who my heart belongs to? Now, let, let me ask you a different way because uh, all those things do demonstrate who your heart belongs to. So where do you stand? You know, uh, he says, let's let's give our bodies wholly to him, our every fiber of our being to him because of his great mercy. Let our lives be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way that we worship him. We have lots of expressions of worship, but the way that we live our lives is the ultimate act of worship. This is truly the way that we worship him. And then it comes a verse that if you grew up in church, this will sound very familiar to you. It's one I had to memorize in Sunday school growing up. It's one that no matter how many times I've heard this or read this verse, it still has just as much meaning for me today because the, the truth of it is, has stayed the same, even if it looks differently. But he says in verse 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know what God's will is for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I I like the way the NLT words that makes what is uh, kind of easy to to miss in the NIV explicitly clear here. Because in the NIV, it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is passive. It's not us that does the transforming, it's him. It's him. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The NLT explicitly says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And church, there's never been a more simple truth that is so difficult to live out. You know, most of us, when we get up here and preach, we're we're also preaching to ourselves. 
Um, and I was just reminded as we were preparing for this week that this is so true, no matter who you are, no matter what your background, no matter what you're dealing with, the temptation is going to be self-absorption, that, that we are going to focus on all of our own issues to the neglect of somebody else. And if I, th- if I think that I, I could pivot this or, 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 or point out exactly where it is that this happens in our hearts, I think it's, it's in a simple, we like the hero's journey, right? Like any, any story, any movie, any TV show, any book that you read, it has the hero's journey more than likely. There's the hero who's under-equipped and who's a nobody who, who becomes a somebody because he's, uh, he's faced with adversity and conflict and he has to overcome it in order to save everybody else. That's the hero's journey. It's how they blossom into the hero from not being a hero, right? And oftentimes in our hearts and our minds, when we look at our lives, when we look at our struggles and we're, we're trying to overcome adversity, which we, we all do, we view ourselves, I think, as the hero in the, in the story that is overcoming adversity. And well, well, there's a place where we need to work through our own stuff we're not the ones that do the transforming. We're not the main character in our story. He is. And I think if we keep that simple truth in focus, that will radically transform our approach. Because Romans 12, 1 and 2 is not just uh, uh, an appeal to stay away from peer pressure. It is so much deeper and so much more rich than that. Because as we partake in God's plan for our lives, you can't, you can't turn a, part, a parked car. You've you got to be moving it. And as we take part in God's plan in our lives, as we start to do the things that he's called us to, even if we don't know what that is, but we just start to obey, that fruit will start to show up in our lives. So is he the hero in our story? Or have we tried to put ourselves in that position? Because I think we'll always fall short. So what parts of your life need to be pruned away in order to make way for God to do his work in and through your life. That's my question for you this morning. We're going to wrap up here in a second. We've got one more video to show you, and then uh, we'll wrap up and get you guys out of here. Let's go. Get it done. Get it done. Yeah. Get it done. Get down and get up. This is what matters. What? Why? Why are we? Why are we even doing this? Because physical training has eh, some value, right? But doesn't isn't this, doesn't godliness have value for for everything? <laughs> then you'll be able to shine the light of Jesus for everyone to see. All right. Fine. Fine. You win. Yeah, that, we'll do that. That's fine, too. Summer Sarge is still cooler than VBS. <sighs> He's right. <laughs> that was just plain silliness. So if you are um, wanting to our, our decorations to not look like this at VBS, we have some donation cards in the lobby. We've, uh, we've actually made an Amazon wish list this year as well, and that has been going so well. So many of you guys have donated to VBS um, with craft supplies and decorations and the things that we need to make that week happen. So thank you, and there's still more to do out there as well. And also, if you are wanting to be a game changer for VBS, we are gonna need or lots. Or Summer Surge. Or, yeah, or Summer Surge, sorry. Um, we're gonna need a lot more people to step forward and just donate some of their time as well. So, yeah. Yeah, and if, uh, if you'd like to continue the conversation or talk with anybody today, we'd be happy to talk with you in the next steps room. If you go out to the lobby and to the left, uh, we'd love to be able to connect with you and uh, keep the conversation going. So thank you guys so much for being here. Let me pray for you guys, and then we'll, we'll dismiss here. Lord, we thank you for this day, and thank you for each and every person who's here. I ask that you would just move in our hearts and in our lives, and that we would be uh, um, open and receptive to your moving and your spirit leading. And uh, I ask that you would help us to uh, put you above all else. 
Um, and uh, we thank you for the community that we have here. Um, and uh, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for joining us for Victory On Demand. Here at Victory, we believe that we all have a next step, and we pray that God uses what you've experienced here today to stir something in your life and to lead you to the next step in your faith journey, whatever that may be. If you'd like to talk to someone about taking your next step, please let us know by clicking the button that's popping up on your screen right now. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given to us. We celebrate generosity in the work that God does through our sacrificial giving in our community and around the world. If your experience today has helped you or blessed you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God by going to victorycc.live slash give. Again, if you haven't experienced a live victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. Remember, here at Victory, we don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. We'll see you next time.